Uh, uh, thanks uh, again uh, for the wonderful opportunity that you've granted me to uh, share God's word with you. It's been a long, long time since I fellowshiped with, uh, with uh, Sukimo Central people, uh, but I've been following a couple of things online, especially on Sabbaths. But it's, it's a privilege again to join in live worship where we can share God's word and strengthen each other. Uh, without any uh, further ado, I'll just go straight to our message today, uh, which is uh, Faithful and Unfaithful Servants. And uh, we are almost at the very tail end of uh, Matthew, our studies on Matthew chapter 24. And as you can recall, uh, the context of Matthew chapter 24 uh, that we're going to study today about the faithful and faithful servants, although we'll delve into chapter 25 a bit too, is um, Christ um, has pronounced uh, that the temple is going to be destroyed. Uh, he's looked forward and already seen that uh, there's, there's the destruction of Jerusalem, there's the destruction of the temple. And this caused a lot of agony to the disciples who are listening to him and who are with him. And uh, because of this, they reached out to Christ. And uh, in chapter 24, verse 1, uh, it says uh, that, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, Do you not see all these things? I surely say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, and it proceeds forth. So you, you realize that uh, in verse three, Christ is sitting upon the Mount of Olives and then the disciples come to him uh, uh, come to him privately. And so as uh, the disciples come to him privately, uh, they ask him a couple of questions. When shall these things be? Uh, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And then now Christ gives all this, uh, he gives parables, he also gives the signs, and he, he just has this long, long discourse with them spanning chapter 24, I think through to almost chapter uh, 25, yeah, the end of chapter 25. And primarily this, uh, this, these two chapters, Christ is addressing his believers, he's directing people that believe in him, he's directing his servants. And that is the context for, for our study today. Uh, I'd like us then to go directly uh, to the to the meat of today's study, chapter 24 from verse 42 to 51. Uh, probably someone can read it for us. And then I'll I'll pick I'll pick it from there. Matthew chapter 24. Verse, uh, it's verse? 42 to 51. Ah, 42. Watch, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief will come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find in so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with all the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the, with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thanks so much, Spencer. 
So uh, we realize in verse 42 that uh, Christ says that watch therefore for you do not know what hour that your Lord does come. But know this, that if the good one of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So assuming assuming uh, uh, you you had some intel that uh, somebody is coming to steal your car or is coming to steal from your house or is coming to steal your phone or your laptop, most, most likely uh, they would not su succeed because you'd be very, very watchful and you'd be very careful to ensure that nothing happens. Uh, but verse 44 says that, therefore, be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. I think this is one of those verses that uh, I, I really like us to just think about. It's very easy to think about it in the sense that the people who are not who are going to be uh, uh, surprised by Christ's second coming. But Christ says here emphatically that you should always be ready for in an hour that you do not think, that is when the Son of Man comes. And I think that just sets the tone for, for the whole study, so that we should be daily making preparations and growing daily in Christian virtues because Christ's coming might really, really catch us off guard if you're not ready and prepared. If we look at Galatians chapter... Um, Galatians, just a moment. Um, actually, it's not Galatians that I wanted to say. I think it should be First Thessalonians, rather. First Thessalonians, uh, chapter 5. First Thessalonians, chapter 5. It says that, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The same illustration used in Matthew 24, 43. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. We are of not, you are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love for an, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. But Paul also tells us that this, uh, the second coming of Christ is going to catch people like to completely off guard. And my, my question to you is, what assurance do you have as a Christian today? that Christ's second coming is not going to surprise you. The note says that we should, uh, that Christians should, uh, especially Seventh-day Adventists in this regard, uh, should be preparing uh, for what is to come upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. As sad will it be if any of us will be found among that group that these things will get uh, off guard, that we will also be in that overwhelming surprise that will uh, will engulf everyone that does not know Christ intimately. So let's continue verse, to, verse uh, 45. So that is the context of this parable that we're going to look at, or uh, this illustration that Christ gives. Verse 44 says that, therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes, who then is a faithful, and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom the Lord, whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and cut him asunder and appoint him a portion of the hypocrites. A couple of things stand out here. Verse 45 says that, who is then a faithful and wise servant? So there are servants who are faithful and wise. But then, verse 48 but if that evil servant shall say in his heart. So there are two categories here. 
Christ is primarily speaking to his disciples, his followers, and he says there are two categories of people in his service. There are those who, who we can call faithful and wise, but then there are those who are called evil servants. Both of them are servants. They are probably going through the, uh, the motions of religion. They are doing all that is required. They're going for missions. They're doing Bible studies. They're listening to God's word. They're doing all the things that you would say that Christ's servant ought to do. But Christ puts a separation and calls a group faithful and wise and another evil servant. And what is the difference? What is the line of demarcation between these two? It says that, verse 45, that the Lord has made him ruler over his household to give them food in due season. And the food here we're talking about is the word of God. We are preaching present truth. So the faithful and wise servant is giving God's people who are the household. He's giving them, he or she is giving them God's word, present truth in its most pure and sincerest form. Unfortunately, there's this evil servant who does not do that uh, the same. Verse 46 says that blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. What I'd like to make an application from this is the, the, the blessing is, is, is pronounced upon the servant who, when the, when the master comes, will find that this servant has been proclaiming uh, the, the, the truth of the gospel, Christ's truth, in its pure, unadulterated, and undiluted form. He is the one to whom the blessing is pronounced. So my question to us today is, as you look upon your life and as I look upon my life, as I reflect upon how I'm living my life, can I honestly say that when Christ comes today, he'll find me as this faithful and wise servant, breaking the bread of life to people, uh, preaching the present truth, and more so living the present truth. Because the, the line of demarcation, it seems to me, between this faithful and wise and the evil servant is that this faithful and wise servant gives food to the household or Christ's church in due season. And also, the servant does this until the Lord finds him doing so. You know, in when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, now, I'd like us to read First Corinthians chapter 4. I presume. Actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, rather. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Another version says that, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we cannot be discouraged. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, that verse 46, that, Blessed is that servant whom when the Lord comes shall find him doing that very thing of distributing food in the Lord's household. In the, in the Lord's work, we are prone to discouragement. We are prone uh, to feel like our work is not being appreciated. But the blessed servant is that servant whom when the Lord comes shall find him giving food to his household in due season. Second Corinthians chapter four says that, seeing then we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we cannot get discouraged because of the weight of the work that Christ has given to us. There's no way we can get discouraged. In Numbers chapter 21 verse four, we read of an interesting story uh, about the children of Israel. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Let me read it. It talks about them, the children of Israel, and it says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. I don't know how you are in your Christian experience. Are you discouraged because of the way of the Christian work? You know, you might have come all the way from Egypt. 
And now, as the children of Israel, they're journeying through Mount Hor, around the land of Edom. And you're discouraged because maybe you thought you should have gotten to where you ought to have a, a, a long while ago. And this is what happened to the children of Israel. And you remember that when this happened, when they were discouraged because of the way, and they murmured and complained, God sent, uh, sub, okay, God, God uh, removed the protection that he had put over them and serpent started biting them left, right, center until that serpent of brass was lifted, which Christ says that unless the son of man be lifted as Moses lifted up the serpent, the, the, the serpent in the wilderness, then that is the only way through which we can be saved. And you might have been discouraged as the children of Israel and you might be have lost a couple of battles. But as the children of Israel looked and lived, and I encourage you and implore you and encourage you to look at the lifted Savior who was crucified for our sins that we might live. Paul says that because we have this ministry, because we have received mercy, we cannot be discouraged. And in Matthew chapter 24, just going back, we are told that this servant, this faithful and wise servant, cannot get discouraged. When the Lord comes, the faithful and wise servant is still doing the Lord's work. Verse 47, very less I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48, but and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. You know, the evil servant is contrasted with the faithful servant in this way. The evil servant does not openly put away the second coming of Christ. The evil servant does not say, oh, Christ is not going to come. He's not like that open scoffer who says, where is the promise of his coming? For since the earth uh, was, uh, everything continues as it were. Uh, he's not that person. The evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. You know, our actions, our plans, and our the things that give us joy are the things that determine and the things that show whether truly we can say that Christ is coming soon or Christ delays his coming. Today, the kind of decisions I make on a day-to-day -day basis are the determinants, whether I'm saying in my heart that Christ delays his coming. Because you see this evil servant says in his heart, does not say uh, it, uh, does not proclaim it loudly, does not uh, write it in a blog or does not send it everywhere. He just says it in his heart that my Lord delays in his coming. But what we see are the results of what is going on in his heart. And then it says in the book Patrick and Prophets that before a soul is led into open sin, a long preparatory pre process and be known or unseen by men goes on in the heart. Before somebody just decides to do the craziest thing, the person who you thought is a Christian, there are those moments that they have mulled and toyed with sin in their heart. And this evil servant, this is what the evil servant has been doing. The evil servant thinks in his heart that my Lord delays in his coming. And what does he do? He shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. So the people who are actually doing God's work, he starts to discourage them, he starts to fight them, he starts to talk, to talk negatively about them. Oh, you're so much in earnest. Stop, 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 your zeal is too much. And this servant engages in such activities and also joins up with people who are not, uh, people, are not are people who are not looking forward to Christ coming. He starts to, be drunk with the drunken. And instead of supporting his fellow servants, he smites them. Sad will it be that you have been a servant of God. You have accepted the message of present truth. 
but you have put Christ coming away so far into the future and your actions tell us so. I'd like to challenge you to look into your lives, each and every one of us, that what are some of the things that we can say deep down in our hearts that these things, the decisions that I've made, definitely, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, point uh, to the fact that I've actually said in my heart that my Lord delays his coming. Verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour that he's not aware of. So this servant has planned his life so well that he's put Christ's coming to be at a certain duration. Uh, it's probably around this time that Christ will come. So right now, I can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But Christ's coming will be so unexpected by this servant. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. And I'd like just to <laughs> repeat this one. But you know, at times we put so many things so much into the future because we think Christ's coming will be delayed. But know for sure that Christ's coming will get the people, most of the world, it will get them flat footed. And verse 50 says that the Lord of that servant shall come in a day that he looks not for him. So the, the, the Lord so, so the Lord comes and this servant is totally surprised because this servant, it's not like uh, he does not know or he's not thinking that the Lord will come. He's just that he's put it at a different time from when the Lord comes. Let me give, let me give an illustration. I had, uh, somebody told me a story of someone who was working very, very hard a very uh, hardworking person in the government, uh, born and raised in an Adventist family. The family was going to church, very Adventist, but he used to work on Sabbaths. Every single Sabbath he used to work. And he worked so hard. And, you know, probably he was just putting, uh, he was still just thinking, okay, maybe after retirement is when probably I'll start keeping the Sabbath. And just a few maybe a few years or a couple of months before his retirement, he died so suddenly. And I think there are so many of us who live such kinds of lives. Oh, uh, parents tell their kids, oh, just, just go ahead, uh, study on Sabbath, do all these things on Sabbath. And then after, after you've done, you're done with school, you'll start keeping the Sabbath. It's that experience of the evil servant who says, my Lord delays his coming. They are very sure that by the time they finish, by the time they finish campus, or by the time they finish school, a Christ would not have come, so they'll have some time to serve Christ and follow him. And there's so many things that we do in our Christian lives. We push so many things, the decisions that should have been made yesterday, we push them to years ahead. While we do not have that assurance that we will live to see that day, or that Christ will not have come by that time. This evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, but his actions are the ones that show us that truly he's put forth, he's put far, far away the second coming of Christ. Verse 51, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's so sad that this servant He's appointed his portion with the hypocrites. And uh, we're told that, you know, the word hypocrite in the Greek, it just means an actor. He's been going through the motions of religion. And as Paul says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny their power. And so this is the, this is the predicament that you're faced with. The faithful and wise servant, the Lord will find him still working, still giving food in its season to his household, to his church. But the evil servant, unfortunately, Christ's coming gets him 
totally, totally unprepared. My last submission on this uh, uh, illustration that Christ gave our parable. How, how, how are you living your life? Are you living your life with reference to the second coming of Christ? Are the decisions that you're making daily showing that truly, honestly, you're totally sold to Christ and that you're longing for his appearing? In, uh, in the book of Second Timothy, as Paul is about to be executed, he says in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me, but unto all of them that love his appearing. Do you actually long and look forward to the appearing of Christ? That this crown of righteousness, the Lord, our righteous judge, shall give unto all of us who love his appearing. I remember this day I was living, we were just from, <laughs> we were just from uh, Vespers in campus. And a friend of mine said that, hey, man, I, I just pray that Christ does not come before I get married. And to them, that was like, that is the only thing that, <laughs> that, was, that, that was their goal before Christ comes. And okay, the friend got married a couple of weeks ago. But then uh, one of the things that I've always wondered is that, do you actually love his appearing? Or are there things that you'd, that, that Christ's coming would, would really, really interrupt in your life and you didn't want Christ to come until you achieve those things? Do you actually long for and pray for, honestly, for Christ's second coming? I'd like us to have that as a segue into uh, the last parable of the talent. Uh, the context is still the same. Christ still addressing the issues that had been raised by the apostles or the disciples then. But when you read verse 44 and verse 42 and of verse of chapter 24, and then compare it with uh, verse 13 of Matthew 25, it says, Watch ye therefore, for you know not for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. The same context to the two parables. It says, verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. The same thing. The other, the other time, we're talking about two servants, faithful and wise and the evil. Here Christ, the, or rather, uh, this man traveling to a far country called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. And straight away he took his journey. Then he that received five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gathered gained other two. But he that had received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And so he had, and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto them, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you deliver unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto them, Well done. Unto him, rather, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you, that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strode. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. And lo, there you have what is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where, not, where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strode. You ought to have, to have put my money with the bankers, and at my 
coming, I should have received mine own with interest. Take therefore the one talent from him and give to him which has ten talents. For unto everyone that shall, that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see that we see we see two things here. The context is about for the son of man comes in an hour that you do not know. And then finally, the end of this says that there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The same as the previous parable that we just looked at. But this parable is a very interesting one. Uh, it's the parable of the talents. And the parable of the talents uh, in verse 14 says that for the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So this is Christ going back to heaven and he's delivered his goods to his servants. I like a couple of things here. Verse 14 says, who called his own servants? So the people we are, we, we are talking about here are Christ's servants. These are not wild things. These are Christ's own servants. And then it says, and delivered unto them his goods. There's nothing that we have in this world that belongs to us. They're all given unto us in trust by Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says that, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It is a requirement to us as stewards that we be, find, we be found faithful. So Christ calls his own servants and gives him his own goods. And what happens? Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, another uh, two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. So a couple of things here. Christ gives someone five talents, another two and another one. We realize that there's no one who was given zero talents. Everyone was given a talent, at least. It says to every man, each and every one of us, Christ has bequeathed us with a couple of things to be used for his glory. And it's it's sad that, you know, at times we think that we don't, we are not blessed with things or we're with talents. But Christ says very, very clearly that to every person has been given a talent, at least. In Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 3, it says that for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Each and every one of us has been given a measure of faith and grace. Uh, we are told uh, in the book of John that uh, Christ, uh, no, 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 not, uh, I think, yeah, it's in the book of John. Uh, okay, let us just read John chapter 1. Verse 9, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. Each and every one of us, Christ gives that light. Every person has been given some portion of light. Christ has not left us in darkness. He is that true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. And he's dealt each and every one of us a measure of faith. And, you know, it says that Christ gives his servants uh, different talents. And it says that he gave to every man. So we have established that every one of us has been given a talent. But how is the distribution of talents? What is the, uh, what is the method that Christ has used? What is the heuristic that Christ uses to distribute this talent? Is it through just trial and error? No, the Bible makes it very clear. To every man according to his several ability. Each and every one of us has been given some gifts according to our ability. And so some have five, some have two, some have one. But all of us have at least a talent. Verse 15, verse 16 rather. Then he that had received the five talents, this is still putting emphasis. 
These people did not have these talents. These are not the talents they received. Verse 16, he that had received five talents. Verse 17, he that had received two. Verse 18, but he that had received one. All these gifts that we have are given to us in trust by Christ. So where is boasting then? It is excluded. Because there's nothing that we have that we did not that we did that, that we did not first receive. All these things have been given to us by God so that we can make use of them for the benefit of the people around us and for the advancement of his kingdom. Verse 18. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. So Christ comes and settles the accounts with them. So the, the first person who had five brings five others, two, two others. But this that had one does, says this. Oh, it's so sad. Verse 24, then he which had received one talent, the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strolled. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there you have, that is thine. You know, most of the times we think that, uh, let, me, let me rephrase it. The, 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 the saddest reality in this parable is not that the people who have many talents don't use them. It's those who apparently think they are not as endowed with many talents who don't use them for the glory of God. And, you know, you, you hear people, people, people thinking that uh, even in church, you find that one person does so, 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 so many things. But then some members don't do anything. And this is a challenge because people think, people really, really, really look down upon that probably quote unquote one talent that God has given them. And they, looked at, they look at others and think that these others have more talents and then probably should do more for God. The most dangerous position to be in is probably this one talent person who thinks they are not as blessed as others. You think you're not blessed materially. You think you're not blessed uh, with all these gifts that Christ has given, the gifts of the spirit. So when people are asked to pray, you pass that chance by. Everything that you're asked to do in God's service, you can't do because you feel or think that you don't have that endowment of grace. But we know from Ephesians chapter 4, from Romans chapter 12, and 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 12, that each and every one of us, as soon as we yoke ourselves with Christ, God gives us gifts of the Spirit, various gifts, but for the building of the kingdom. I'll, actually, I'll, I'll, I'm impressed to, to share that First Corinthians. I think it's 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 very important. Uh, actually, First Corinthians, chapter twelve, verse um, eighteen. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased Him. God had set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. God is the one who has decided what talents people will have. And then it says, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body. If I today would not do the part that God has given me, maybe in the, in the, in the analogy that Paul is using, I'm the eyes, maybe I'm the hand, then it means that this body would not be complete. Each and every one of us has an appointed place and an appointed work that God has given us to fulfill in this world. 
the success or failure of which would mean that a soul is won or lost for eternity. And then Paul says in verse 22, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You who think that probably you don't, you're not necessary in God's work, you're not part of the body of Christ, you feel like you, you are not really worth it. Paul says, those parts or those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon this we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having, having given more abundance and honor to that part which lacked. There should be, that there should be no schism in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. You are a member of the body of Christ. Yes, as a, as a church family, we are the body of Christ. But you are a member in particular. You are a part of that body. And even if you think you're less honorable, we are told here that those parts which are less honorable are probably the ones which are more necessary. And so let's come back to this one talent person. This one talent person hides his or her talent until the, the, the master comes. It's so sad that those who feel and think that they don't have enough gifting are the one who don't multiply. But you're told in Christ object, object lessons that uh, that the more we work with our little, the more we work uh, in our spheres, the more God multiplies our abilities. So the best way to multiply your abilities today is to work, is to use those talents. Because this talent, the saddest thing is that is not that you don't multiply them uh, as the five or two talent person. The sad thing, the saddest thing about this one talent person is that if eventually you lose that talent because that talent was taken away from that person and given to the one that had a 10 in total now. So any talent that you don't use for God's glory, that you don't use for God's work, will eventually be lost from you. I'd like to read something from the book, uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, uh, 233, Paragraph 2. It says, I was shown that Brother F is buried in the rubbish of the world. So let me just post it in the, in the chat so that we can read together. So you can follow more closely. So I've posted it in the chat. I will show that Brother F is buried in the rubbish of the world. He cannot afford time to serve God, not even to honestly study and pray to know what the Lord would have him do. His talent is buried in the earth. The cares of this life have swallowed up his interest in eternal things. The kingdom of God and the righteousness of Christ are secondary. He loves business. But I saw that unless he changes his course, the hand of God will be against him. He may gather, but God will scatter. He could do good. He could do good. But many have the idea that if their life is a working business life, they can do nothing for the salvation of souls, nothing to advance the cause of their Redeemer. They say that they cannot do things by halves, and they turn from the religious duties and religious exercises and bury themselves in the world. They make their business primary and forget God, and he's displeased with them. If any are engaged in business where they cannot advance in the divine life and perfect and perfect holiness in the fear of God. Oh, I didn't finish that quotation. I'll post the rest. Just a moment. Uh, if any are engaged in business where they cannot advance in the divine life and perfect holiness in the fear of God, they should change to a business in which they can have Jesus with them every hour. So this person is very interesting that he's buried in the rubbish of the world. He cannot afford time to serve God, not even to study God's word and to know, and to pray earnestly to know what God would have him do. 
his talent is buried in the earth. I want to challenge you today. Is your talent buried in the earth? Do you find time to pray and honestly study God's word? Have the cares of this life swallowed up your interest in eternal things? Are the kingdom of Christ and his righteousness secondary to you? What absorbs your interest? Is it your love of business? Is it your love of secular things? We're told here, he loves business, but I saw that unless he changes his course, the hand of God will be against him. You might be doing a lot of business, but every time you're making losses, it's not the, it's not the government or the deep state of the system who's against you, it's God who's against you. You've buried your talent. Many have an idea that if their life is a working business life, they can do nothing for the salvation of souls. Do you feel like you can do nothing for the salvation of souls? You say that probably, oh, you know, there are people who probably can do that better. If you make your business primary and forget God, God is displeased with you. And if you're in that position, you have to just ask to make a change and find something that can allow you to serve God. And so this one talent person, is probably most of us here. Most of us who are absorbed in our studies, in our business, in our workplaces, we don't find time to pray and honestly seek for God's work, for God's will. We don't work for the salvation of souls. And finally, I just want to make an application about these talents. Primarily, Verse 18, what do these talents talk about primarily? But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Primarily the talents talk also about money. Like primarily it's about money that Christ gave these people. Christ even asked him, why did you, didn't you take this money to the bankers? And when I come, I'll get it with interest. It's primarily money. You know, the things that God has entrusted to us, I had quite a number of them that I'd, I'd have wanted us to look at, but I don't think we'll have enough time. We have time, talent, and treasure. I'll talk ta talent, I'll talk generally gift, the gifting that God has given us, these natural abilities. So we have time, talent, and treasure. Man, I don't know. Let, let, let me see. Let me see the ones that I can handle very quickly. I'd like to talk about talent first. When you read Exodus chapter 31, it's a very, very interesting story. And God says, Well, I'll be very quick uh, just to summarize this one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel the son of of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge and in the all manner of, work of, of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded you. God wants to build his temple in this passage. And he says, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and I have filled him with the spirit of God to do all these things. And verse six, and I have given with him a holy up. Just a couple of things here. This is a very, sec this is a, this is a very probably secular calling that this guy has. He's a mason. He's just building things here and there. He's cutting stones, he's doing all these things. But when God wants to do a work that lasts for eternity, he puts his spirit in you. First, he calls you by name. He puts his spirit in you and he gives you people to work with. I have called him by name. I have filled him with the spirit of God. I have given him a holy up. I want to challenge you today. You might be a teacher probably even let me say at in an Adventist school or anywhere. Any teacher can teach and students will pass. Even the most random atheist can come and teach in SAR and students will still 
pass math and probably go to good schools. But if you're doing a work for eternity, if you're do if you're serving God, we have to work on a different platform. An accountant can make the best treasurer in our church and balance the books of accounts. But if they are not filled with the spirit of God, they are not doing a work for eternity. They're not doing God's work. Natural ability, natural talent, unless you're called by God, filled with his spirit, and God surrounds you with people that he's filled with his spirit, your work is in vain. I'd like to challenge you as a student, as somebody who's in any station of life. Has God called you by name? Has he filled you with his spirit? And has he given you people to work with you? You might just say, probably I'm just a driver. Are you filled with the spirit of God? A driver can drive, but if you want to do a work that lasts for eternity, God has to put his spirit in you. I'd like to talk about two others very quickly. I wish we could expound more on that. But in any station of life that you are in, ask diligently that you be filled with the spirit of God. I want to talk about the, we've talked about talent. I want to talk about time. We are told in the book Christ Object Lessons that of no gift or of no talent will God require a stricter account than that of time. Nothing will, will God require a strict account than that of time. Why so? Let me let me let me let me say just a um, let me read something from Christ Object Lessons 343, paragraph 3. Yet God has called us to call him, yet God has called us to serve him in the temporal affairs of life. Diligence in this work is as much a part of truly true religion as is devotion. Diligence in the temporal affairs of this life is as much a part of true religion as is devotion. Brother F was being chastised and castigated by God for being too busy in his work that he forgot his devotional life. But on the flip side, we are told here that diligence in the temporal affairs of life is part of true religion as is devotion. The Bible gives no en endorsement to idleness. Idleness is the greatest curse that afflicts our world. Idleness. Stop all, don't think about all these other things. It's just idleness. That is the greatest curse that afflicts our world. Find something to do. You might not have work, but find something to do. And I wish we could talk more about that. But let me talk about the last thing. We've talked about time. We've talked about treasure. But I'd like us to talk about talent. Uh, we've talked about talent and treasure. Talent and time, I want us to talk about treasure. In time, one thing that I'd like to just encourage you, Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14, if you honestly keep the Sabbath, God will surely bless your work. That, that, is, that is a given. But let's talk about treasure. God has bequeathed to us a lot of treasure. Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of power might not be into us, but to God. I'd like to challenge you. What are some of this treasure that God has given you, that you're using, that you, may, you're, you're ought, you ought to use for his own glory? Is it wealth? Is it influence? Is it mental capabilities? What is it that God has given you? I'd like us to stop there, and then we'll pick some of these points uh, as, we, as we look at next week, the, the next lesson. And I just pray that may God bless you abundantly as you reflect upon these things. I'd like us to pray, uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like us to pray with someone today. There's probably someone who's whose devotional life is not very stable. You're too absorbed in the things of this life. It's business, it's school, it's all these things. At times it's entertainment, 
it's phone, it's you know, it's it could be anything. I'd like to pray with that person. You know, maybe you, you you want just to be that faithful and wise servant who will not be discouraged. Maybe you're a church leader and you've been so much discouraged because of what is going on around. The evil servants have smitten you here and there. I'd like to pray with that person. If 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 there's any such person, I'd like I'd just like you to pray together with me. You know, we can't we can't stand, we can't, yeah. I just like to pray with you and God sees you. In, in whatever place you are. I'd just like to pray with you. Just like to challenge you to take time to pray, take time to study God's word and to share his word faithfully till Christ comes. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, you've told us in your word that moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. May you be found faithful. May you keep us strong in the faith May you help us, dear Lord, to put the right, esti- the right estimate upon each and everything in our lives. May we take time to study your word. May we take time to pray. But also we pray that may you give us diligence in, temporal af- in the temporal affairs of this life. There are those of us who probably have been discouraged because of the way that it is long and rough. There are those who are probably discouraged in their Christian journey. Maybe their brethren have assailed them. Maybe things of this world, the allurements of this world have really put them at crossroads with you, Lord. We do pray that, Lord, you who sees in secret, may you touch that soul. May you challenge them that there's a life in a look at the sacred cross. That just as Moses lifted that serpent, and that everyone who looked lived, we pray that each and every one of us today may look and live that we might start a new walk with you, that we might be that faithful and wise servant, that we might be those servants who multiply their talents for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. I'll hand it back over to Spencer, I presume. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for taking us through uh, the two parables. I believe we have all been blessed by the wonderful thoughts from these parables. Who then is that faithful servant? Who then is that is a faithful and one servant? I hope this is a question that we will ask ourselves this week and we will ponder over these things. May we become uh, like the faithful Berens. May we study to see if these things indeed are so. Now, uh, yeah, because of time, I think I'll just invite everyone who's, uh, who is attending this meeting for the first time, uh, feel, please feel free to attend even the next ones. We have three remaining studies, and uh, we hope to see you in all of them. We are meeting on Sundays and Thursdays. So same time, 7.30 for prayer and uh, 8 p.m. for Bible study. Sorry for, because today I sent the wrong link, but next time well, I will have to be... <laughs> I will have to be wise and faithful to, to, to at least counter check. So uh, I'd like to welcome you to, to our next study. This will be on Thursday, and our topic will be Reflections on the Ecumenical Charity. Uh, wow, that's a, an interesting name, but I believe we are, we are tuning ourselves to this name. So welcome to that study. We shall meet on Thursday, 7.30 for prayer, 8 for the study, and I hope to see all of us there. Uh, since we have prayed, I'd like to end with a benediction that may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord lift his countenance upon us. May he give you peace. May he go ahead of you in everything that you do this week. May he grant you the desires of your heart. And may he answer your prayers that your joys may be full. Uh, go into this week in Jesus' name and know that he will bless you. So till next time, good night and goodbye.